Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, are we ready yet? Am I? Yes. <laughs> good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to you all to Chatham House this evening, um, both to those of you here and those of you who've joined us online from across the world. Uh, a very special welcome to our chief guest, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration of Ghana, uh, whom I shall introduce a bit more fully later on. Uh, my name is Amitav Banerjee. I um, work for the Global Leadership Foundation, uh, which is a group of 44 retired leaders from across the world uh, who are quietly available to give advice on invitation to any of today's leaders who feel they might welcome some peer advice. Um, it is chaired by Helen Clark of South Africa, who is also a co-president of Chatham House. But I imagine the reason I've been invited to moderate today's event um, is that before joining GLF, uh, I spent 25 years at the Commonwealth Secretariat uh, in various capacities, retiring as the political director. Uh, I've therefore had the privilege of seeing the Commonwealth evolve uh, through two and a half decades after two milestone developments, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of apartheid in South Africa. And it's lovely to see several Commonwealth friends here. Uh, before I introduce the subject and our speaker, uh, let me make some housekeeping announcements. Today's event is on the record. Online attendees should submit questions using the Q&A function, but please keep your questions succinct. I will, with the help of Chatham House staff, endeavor to get through as many of the questions as possible, though obviously we have limited time and we can't possibly cover all of them. Um, for those asking questions online, you may be asked to unmute yourself, but if you'd rather not do that, please indicate when you ask your question and your question will then be asked on your behalf. For those in the room, please raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. And if I call on you, a handheld microphone will come to you. Please remain seated. Please identify yourself and ask your question. And again, please kindly be brief. That ends the housekeeping information. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, when the modern Commonwealth was born in 1948, um, it was really quite an extraordinary first in international relations. Uh, that a number of former colonies should voluntarily agree to join together with the former colonial power in a voluntary association of states and look collectively to the future and away from the past was quite a remarkable development. It is relevant to point out that other organizations of this type came much later. The Francophonie was constituted in 1970. The Lusophone community was born in 1996. Uh, and the Ibero-American Secretariat only came into being in 2005. But while it was a trailblazer, it was never an easy ride. And the Commonwealth has had its ups and its downs. It has continued to grow and today consists of 56 countries representing nearly one third of the world's population and about one fourth of its global land mass. Increasing membership, and yet others want to join, must be a sign of appeal and of relevance. And on the other hand, it is one of a plethora of international organizations that each member state belongs to and fighting with others for priority. Today's event is taking place at a critical moment. The Commonwealth has just lost a very special leader who served at its head for nearly 70 years and who was often referred to as a glue that held it together. The passing of Queen Elizabeth II and the transfer of the baton to King Charles III is a milestone moment for the Commonwealth. We have also recently seen one Caribbean country move from being one of the remaining realms to becoming a republic and two others announced their intention also to travel in the same direction. We have witnessed two Francophone countries being admitted to Commonwealth membership. 
And the war in Ukraine has impacted on international relations in a way that makes every international organization reassess its role and its relevance. How can the Commonwealth respond to the challenges that face the world and that confront the Commonwealth itself? This is the broad subject of this evening's event, and we are here to listen to Madame Shirley Botchway. Uh, she has been the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration of Ghana since January 2017. She has extensive experience in foreign policy, having earlier served twice as Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. She led Ghana's successful bid to become a member of the UN Security Council for 2022-23. And she has just returned from chairing a Security Council meeting in New York, and believing it, believe it or not, is going to get on another plane back to New York tomorrow. She has also held other ministerial portfolios in the course of her distinguished political career. And may I add that there is something particularly special about Ghana and the Commonwealth. Not only was Ghana the first Commonwealth country in Africa to become independent and join the Commonwealth, excluding apartheid South Africa, but it was Kwame Nkrumah that pushed for the Commonwealth to have an independent secretariat rather than having it continue to reside in the Commonwealth Relations Office of the United Kingdom. This led to the formation of the Commonwealth Secretariat in 1965. Madam Minister, welcome again, and the floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, distinguished members both here and online, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased and honored to share my ideas with you on the Commonwealth at a time of great strain for national economies the existential crisis of climate change and natural disasters, and the enormous opportunity it presents us for building resilience through new ways of doing things. Let me thank Chatham House for providing this very unique forum and Amitav Banerjee for chairing the event. The Commonwealth provides a unique setting for international cooperation with the ability to convene 56 countries from five different regions, including some of the largest and richest countries in the world and some of the smallest and most vulnerable. The Commonwealth has a population of 2.5 billion. 60% of this population is aged 30 or younger. By numbers, demographic data, political profile, wealth and economic potential, as well as reprofiling to build resilience in the face of climate change and future world of work, the Commonwealth should be the second most consequential organization of states globally. But the question we must ask ourselves is whether it is so. We must acknowledge the contributions of past secretaries general since 1965 from Arnold Smith, Sridhar Rampal, Emeka Anyako, Don McKinnon, Kamalesh Sharma, and our current Secretary General, Patricia Scotland KC. Each of these leaders faced challenges of their times and did deliver for the Commonwealth family. We must salute them. Our Commonwealth does enable member states in different regions of the world, consisting of a variety of races and representing a number of interests and points of view to cooperate through exchange of opinions in a friendly, informal, and intimate atmosphere. The Commonwealth Secretariat's purpose, as articulated in the revised agreed memorandum, is to serve member states by facilitating and promoting consultation on matters of common concern, and is also expected to expand and adapt pragmatically in the light of its experience to better carry out its functions. The Charter provides a strong framework for promoting prosperity, democracy and peace, justice and human rights, empowering women and young people, boys and girls, 
amplifying the voices of small and vulnerable states and advocating for environmental protection in terms of the blue economy and climate change through its blue charter. Since the charter and the memorandum were adopted, the terrain for multilateralism has significantly altered. We therefore need to re rethink the new Commonwealth by looking into the original impetus for its creation and the 2005 revised agreed MOU. As we do so, we must be inspired by the aspirations set out in the charter and the realities of our time. We have witnessed the dramatic effects of climate change and natural disasters sweeping our blue islands, as well as flooding, droughts, change in distribution of rainfall, drying up of rivers, abnormal sea walling, locust invasion, and energy poverty in poor member countries. Democracies are facing threats as governments are overwhelmed in responding to the expectations of citizens. Inequality threatens our societies, while the frame of social protection systems opens up our societies to threats from populist and ultra-nationalist, in some cases, violent extremists. The economic orthodoxy, which is responsible for the greatest achievement since the Industrial Revolution, has been exposed by the supply chain impacts of COVID-19, with its resultant shrinking of economies, particularly in the productive sectors, the war in Ukraine, and the worsening climate events associated with climate change. Social mobility has stalled, even though the future world of work, including climate adaptation, opens new opportunities through the way we teach our young leverage innovation and services through ICT, social media, automation, and artificial intelligence. More now than ever, there is the need to build greater resilience and achieve sustainability, enabling us to reduce the risk of present and future shocks and accelerate progress towards attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals. Jobless growth or wealth creation with high unemployment and rising cost of living characterizes nearly all our economies. Commonwealth countries need to create 50,000 decent jobs each day until 2030 to provide opportunities for young people entering the labor market. It is estimated that together, Commonwealth countries need to create three in every five jobs in the world as the labor force in countries such as Japan, China, and Europe shrink. Within the Commonwealth itself, labor mobility does not correspond to the labor rigidities of our economies, denying markets the skills and resources needed to create goods and services needed to power greater inclusive growth and wealth creation. It is quite clear that we have failed to draw the link between young tech workers, the ubiquity of services they provide, and anxiety over physical migration. The Commonwealth has the world's greatest vulnerability to climate change, with 32 of its members being small states. As extreme weather events annually wipe out infrastructure, resulting in devastating droughts and food security and impede other development gains in many Commonwealth countries, most notably in small island developing states. The scope of the strategic failure for a common strategy around renewables is mind boggling. If we are to meet the ambitions of the citizens of the Commonwealth, it is clear that we need a development cooperation framework that works for all the Commonwealth as a common community. Such a model will not be based on the assumptions of progress under which assistance from the rich donors to recipient nations lead to slow assistance, slow incremental change in the developing countries and locks in financial and other inflows to the donor countries. Either way, 
This is a cooperation model that is not working for industrialized or developing parts of the Commonwealth. I'd like to propose six areas for repositioning the Commonwealth to transform the economies of the countries in the Commonwealth, enable inclusive development and climate resilience, and respond to the expectations of the hundreds of millions across the Commonwealth for a good life. These are trade and investment, youth, education, skills, innovation and startups, mobility and labor markets, climate change, small states, and managing resources for an effective Commonwealth institution. Trade and investment. The largest number of citizens in the Commonwealth do not earn enough to power the production and market expansion needed to create economic security whether in the industrialized or developing regions of the Commonwealth. We need to deliver a framework for Commonwealth trade to surpass the potential 2 trillion United States dollars trade within the Commonwealth. Having a common Commonwealth strategy for industrialization and economic diversification strategically linked to regional integration agreements and economic partnership agreements within and beyond the Commonwealth is a guarantee against the stagnation that is widespread across, across our nations. Our citizens watch as we struggle with policies to raise growth in isolation through austerity and high taxes. The pie is simply not capable of feeding everyone unless consumer-based market expansion considers the potential of our 2.5 billion population. Youth education skills, innovation, and startups. Young people in the Commonwealth constitute a third of all young people in the world. With advances in ICT, automation and AI, and the innovations of social media for distance learning, building the tech, and other workers of the 21st century for a Commonwealth-wide market of high knowledge, intensive innovation and services is an achievable goal in the short term. Closing the Commonwealth's digital gap in health, education, and trade, building the digital infrastructure to boost connectivity within and between Commonwealth countries is an important way forward. Taking advantage of the best practices and attainments across the Commonwealth, we can design core curriculum and common standards and facilitate access to borderless financing to ensure that we are the leaders in innovation, startups, and services in the world. Mobility and labor markets. Labor shortages and other rigidities, as well as the lack of opportunity drive on safe, disorderly, and unregulated migration that bedevil policy and public sentiment in the richer parts of the Commonwealth. A Commonwealth-wide mobility compact can help redress labor and skills demand through safe, orderly, and regulated migration, while the ability to teach or train young people wherever they live in the Commonwealth as well as a common Commonwealth market, allows work and services to be exchanged without relocation of workers across borders. Climate change. It is impossible to look at a future looking Commonwealth without a robust Commonwealth strategy on climate adaptation. We need to achieve a resilient Commonwealth by enhancing climate change leadership and technical assistance unlocking vital finance for vulnerable countries, building blue and green economies across the Commonwealth, and helping members overcome external shocks. Within the Commonwealth, we have huge needs for development and installation of renewables. We also have leaders in the production and servicing of renewables. With credit and other financing from the richer part of the Commonwealth, we will ensure that each member of the Commonwealth benefits from the renewable revolution and low carbon transition of the economies. And those concerned about the cost of transition would be open to implementing the emission standards agreed to at the conference of parties. This is the true win-win. 
No one loses, including those who provide financing at market rates. Small states. Small states face unique development challenges. These countries are particularly vulnerable to exogenous shocks, such as natural disasters and climate change. With limited economic opportunities and significant migration, they often face capacity constraints. Small states remain susceptible to external shocks because of their geographic positioning, inherent, inherent structural challenges, and deep integration into the global economy. On the other hand, we have seen the possibilities of small states taking advantage of the economies of scale, the wider Commonwealth office. Commonwealth should continue to put a special lens on small states in support of building resilience and promoting inclusive development in these vulnerable economies. We must prioritize small states to better access sustainable financing, build resilience, and have a voice on the global stage. This requires leveraging our convening power for consensus building and the formation of Commonwealth positions in key global policy fora and advocacy efforts to secure the uptake of Commonwealth ideas in strategic international decision-making bodies to ensure that our small states achieve climate resilience and economic development. Managing resources for an effective Commonwealth institution. An ambitious Commonwealth should be funded at comparative levels as other multilateral organizations. Together with a more credible program resource envelope, it is time to review the human resourcing and budget of the Secretariat. This would enable more resources to be plowed back into programs, as well as ensuring a resilient Secretariat with long-term stability, attracting and retaining the best of the Commonwealth's talent in service to all members. Across the organization, we need to make decisions on how we take advantage of the expertise from member states, including from academia and research organizations as secondments to the Secretariat to enable the cross-fertilization that would enrich the work of the Secretariat and transform our Commonwealth. The potential for tapping into the pool of experienced and retired Commonwealth professionals who want to offer their service pro bono to Commonwealth countries also remains to be exploited. To conclude, we are in this together. We must acknowledge that the true value of our Commonwealth is linked to our common health, our common lives, and common values. We need to leverage our common wealth and economic potential, as well as potential for reprofiling to build resilience in the face of our changing world. The rich part of the Commonwealth needs the poorer part as much as the poorer part needs the richer part. Unless we strategize on how to make the developing country members of the Commonwealth who constitute 94% of the organization, a vital part of an agenda of ensuring and promoting democracy and good governance, economic transformation, and resilience of all the Commonwealth, we shall all be the poorer for it. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for sharing your vision of the Commonwealth and how it can make itself even more relevant to the people of the Commonwealth, to the governments of the Commonwealth. I think your focus on engaging young people on labor mobility, on um, how the rich and the poor can strengthen each other and coexist and play to their strengths to achieve the sustainable development goals are all extremely relevant. And um, I want to just probe you a little bit more on the, on the, on the question of climate change and the environment. Um, this meeting is taking place as we have a very big summit happening in Sharm el-Sheikh. Uh, President Nana Kufuado is there. Um, yesterday, the UN Secretary General put things, I thought, rather dramatically when he said, we are on a climate highway to 
climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. Um, it is very stark in Commonwealth countries as well. Uh, recently, we saw Pakistan reeling from floods. Your, your neighbor, Nigeria, has been experiencing severe flooding. Um, cyclones and hurricanes batter small islands. Maldives and Kiribati uh, face extinction if the sea level continues to rise. What do you think the Commonwealth can do with its variety of members to galvanize action to, towards more effectively fighting climate change? Thank you very much. One thing that the Commonwealth can do as we speak, we have the Secretary General in Shamil Sheikh advocating for the small states and for Commonwealth countries to make our voices heard. And especially the 32 small vulnerable states amongst us, some of whom are under the threat of being wiped out completely. And so for me, I think it's extremely important that we need to have our voices heard and to bring to the fore what exactly is happening in our member countries. And so that's one thing that the Commonwealth, I believe, is doing quite well. Another thing also is to, to, to let the world know that climate change is not just about the environment, but it has a direct effect, impact on the lives of people. Today, you have rivers, you have lakes drying up. And it therefore means that people who survive need that those river bodies or those uh, water bodies to survive no longer can do so. And so there's a lot of migration moving about and so on and so forth. And I, I use Africa as an example, that there are several countries that um, are feeling the, the, the effects of droughts, of floods, um, drying up of, of, of water bodies, and their very survival is, is threatened as a result. So we need the Commonwealth already. Commonwealth is doing quite a bit. We need Commonwealth to focus, yes, on the small island states, the small and vulnerable states, but also on the big ones, because we are clearly seeing the effects of it and we need attention. Um, look at what plans the, the member countries have and see how best they can, they can help member countries. Um, first of all, look at the plans. How do we uh, deal with these issues? And also how do we surmount the issues? Um, because these issues affect the lives, the living of the, the citizens of the Commonwealth. So what do we do in terms of uh, their resilience? How do we um, ensure that um, we become resilient? Um, is it in farming methods? Um, is it in, in, in ensuring that um, our economies are, 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 are helped one way or the other? These are not affecting only the small vulnerable states or the developing country. Even the, the, the developed countries now can and now face um, issues to do with climate change. And so I think we are in, we are in this together. And we need to find ways of, of ensuring that um, the, the effects are, are actually dealt with. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, when the Commonwealth was, was born, the modern Commonwealth, there was a great emotional bond amongst some of the leaders of that time, the, the Nehru's, the Nyerere's, the Kaunda's, the, the Nkrumah's of the world. As time progressed, um, new generations of leaders have come into office. And it is for them a challenge to justify to their people all the time uh, what value the Commonwealth is to them. I think uh, especially today's young people question what value are we getting from our membership of organization X or Y. Every member state belongs to a plethora of international organizations and needs to prioritize and be able to justify. Um, what would you say uh, in terms of what is special about the Commonwealth, if you were uh, advocating continued membership, for example, of the Commonwealth, were it to become an issue? First of all, let me say that um, young people are 
demanding from their governments accountability for the multilateral institutions that they belong to. They're asking, what do we get out of this? What are the benefits? But even more now than ever, um, have we needed to um, belong. We cannot live, uh, um, and no country can live as an island. And so I think that the uniqueness of the Commonwealth is the systems that it gives to member states. However, it is assistance that is usually um, asked for, solicited from the Commonwealth. It's not assistance that comes um, generally to member states. And so I think one of the ways in which we can make the work of the Commonwealth known to our citizens so they see the benefits of the Commonwealth is making it known to them what it actually does. In Ghana, for instance, we've had the Commonwealth assist us build capacity of the judiciary, um, the Peace Council, um, Parliament, um, in maritime matters, um, debt management, I can go on and on and on. However, the only time that the Commonwealth is seen, is visible to the, to the citizens is during election uh, periods um, when the Commonwealth comes in as observers. And also some in, to some extent during Commonwealth games. We need to make sure that the Commonwealth is more visible. And maybe the Commonwealth may also want to do so by making sure that their communication um, is, is more visible, uh, communication in member states. But I think that it is incumbent on member states um, to make the, their engagements with the Commonwealth Secretariat um, well known. Because otherwise, the, the young people will continue, and not just the young people, citizens will continue to, to ask what the benefits are for us uh, belonging to any organization. Um, I will ask one more question before I open the floor, because I don't want to monopolize. Um, another thing that is happening today uh, in the current context, Madam Minister, is that we have a, we have a hot war in Ukraine that is impacting on almost every country across the world in various ways in terms of um, grain and energy supplies, fertilizers, etc. But um, we are seeing also the building of a larger Cold War, a return of the Cold War, if you like. The West and Russia, the United States has this big rivalry with China. The Commonwealth was conceived in, in the context of a Cold War and was a bridge builder because it itself brought together people from developed countries, developing countries, countries that were from all continents. Um, in this polarization where Commonwealth developing countries all have to take sides and not all are very comfortable with doing so, um, how do you think the Commonwealth can be the bridge builder again? Let me say that the war in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine um, by Russia um, is affecting each and every one of our states. And I use Ghana as an example where it has affected our economy. It's coming on the heels of COVID-19 pandemic. We are grappling with the effects of climate change. And then the COVID comes, COVID-19. And now the, 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 um, the war in Russia and Ukraine. And so each country can actually feel the effects of it. And so if I take Ghana, for example, we feel the effects because um, food prices have gone up, um, because of unavailability of fertilizers and also supply chain um, issues, which means that we don't get the grains. Unfortunately, the grain deal is falling apart to bring grains so that some grains can end up in, in, in Africa. So these, these things are affecting us directly. And so you cannot say that you will not take sides. We are calling on them every time to sit at the table to use diplomacy. And I think that one thing that the Commonwealth 
must continue or must ask these powers to do is to use diplomacy to address the issues, negotiate between the two countries. Because what happens in one place far away, because Ukraine is quite far from, 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 from Africa, but we are really feeling the effects of it. And so we are saying that um, countries are saying that, yes, um, this is happening. Um, one country may take a position other than another. We have said that in the interest of international law, um, sovereignty of a nation, the territorial integrity of a nation, it is wrong for this to happen. So Ghana has taken a stand that this should not happen and against the invasion of Ukraine. Others have taken different positions for various reasons. But I think that um, whatever position we take, it is important that we all ask the parties to sit at the table and resolve it because they can go on and on for years, but at the end of the day, it has to come to the table for negotiations, for it to, to, to come to an end. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to the floor and uh, ask for an indication of hands. And I remind you that uh, please identify yourself. Uh, the gentleman there in the beige jacket and the muffler. Uh, Thank, thanks very much. And... Um, my name is Patrick Smith from Africa Confidential. Uh, Minister, you referred to climate change, and yesterday at the first full day at the COP summit in Sharm El Sheikh, there was a pretty fierce debate over Africa's right to initiate new fossil fuel projects, particularly oil and gas projects. And the Western powers were pushing back very hard and saying, you know, if um, Africa with 1.3 billion people now, 2.5 billion people by 2050 goes the fossil fuel route, uh, the world will be burning uh, by the end of the century. Um, a lot of people think that's a hell of a cheek to say that, but it was said. Um, what can, what should Africa do? What should Africa's response do be? And what, and how could the Commonwealth help help it? I mean, the high level panel by Nick Stern and Vera Songwe concluded that to obviate this impending disaster. We need $2 trillion a year funding for developing economies. That clearly isn't even on the agenda at this summit. It's not even being considered, let alone argued about. Um, so what should Africa do? How should it respond? And how should the Commonwealth respond? Thank you very much. I believe that Africa has a right to exploit its natural resources. However, with the issues of climate change, we are being asked not to, or at least be giving a transition. We are saying that we should be allowed to exploit our resources in a responsible way. But just telling us to strand our assets underground, I think it's not fair. Because countries that are developed have done so on exploitation of their nat natural resources. And so I think um, Commonwealth should give us some assistance, um, African countries, and not just African countries, some Caribbean countries as well, um, uh, have natural resources that need to be exploited so that they'll be able to develop. We need monies to develop. We need the finances to develop. And the $2 trillion a year, it's not going to come from anywhere, no country is going to give us that kind of no, 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 nobody is going to give us, put that kind of money um, towards our way. Um, we were told in, 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 in Glasgow that 100 billion a year will be made available to, 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 for us. We haven't seen a penny of that. And therefore, I believe that what needs to be done is to allow us, guide us, to do it in a responsible manner so we can also develop. That's what I can say. Thank you very much. Um, gentleman here. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Um, just to the last point that was can raised. Can you identify yourself? Ah, I'm sorry. My name is Ambassador Ayoke. I used to be a staff of the Commerce Secretariat, head of Africa Department. 
and actually you are boss as director of political affairs. Thank you. Um, the issue we are discussing, I think about climate change, I think is we better stop pretending. We should frame the questions when we are talking of reimagining the Commonwealth, the role the Commonwealth can play is to reframe the question. You cannot have headache and ask me to take paradox for you. And that's what they're asking us to do. You are polluting the air. We are trying to survive, and you're asking us not to do that. But you keep on, China, the big polluters are still doing more of it. And each time we look at Africa, you sit around multilateral systems, there are no Africans seated there. So I think the first thing we should do, let us refrain, refrain the question. What question are we answering about climate change? It's not just a question of don't do this, don't do that. You created the problem. The Congress should take the lead as it's taking the lead for, for small states that in dealing with these international problems, I expect the Commonwealth to change in a way, because I, I like to go back a little bit, Madam. In my generation, we knew what Commonwealth was. Those of us who are above 60, we knew what Commonwealth was. Do the youth of today know the Commonwealth? If the answer is no, the issue of reimagining the Commonwealth should start from that premise. Otherwise, like you already said, Madam, about startups, technical transfer and all of that, the, the youth of today must be put in a way as to understand what Commonwealth stands for. Enough of shared values, shared principles. It is something that is concrete. So I, I quite liked the seven areas that you identified. But I'm saying, in dealing with this question of imagining the Commonwealth, let us reframe the question so that we get the right answers. Let us leave out the rhetorics. I'm a diplomat. I know we can say so many words without saying anything. But let us be specific in to, what we are trying to say. Yeah, Thank you, be, Madam. Let's be brief. Yeah. I take that as a comment, I, I, yeah. Not, yeah. A, not as a question. I'm going to now ask a, a question from, from the online um, Q&A. Uh, this is from William Awomoi. Honorable Minister, you mentioned that young people make up around 65% of the Commonwealth. And indeed, young people are a huge resource, as you highlighted in your six-point development plan. Currently, the Commonwealth Youth Council, for which I am a member, representing the UK, only receives £27,000, which is very small when compared to other international youth groups, such as the European Youth Forum, which receives £2.6 million annually. Next year is the Commonwealth Year of Youth. How should the Commonwealth go about providing finance for its youth programs to ensure that next year really is the year of youth? Thank you very much. I totally agree with, with, with what you've said. Um, if you have 60% of your population being under 30, being young people, you need to pay attention to them. And I'm hoping that next year, the fifth, is it 50th anniversary? I believe that's what it is. It's going to throw lights, more light on the youth and what we need them, we need from them and what is expected of us. Because it cannot be the case where 60% of your population is not part of decision-making. 60%, and I'm not talking about the Commonwealth, but all countries, where 60% of your population Many are not skilled. Many are not in employment. Many are not contributing to the development of our countries. And so I'm hoping that not just the Commonwealth, but countries will come together to provide funds voluntarily for this particular anniversary, and I really would like to see the youth take the stage 
telling us what they want from us and demanding the right to be part of decision-making and to be part of development of Commonwealth nations. We have pushed them to the side for too long. We can, cannot continue to do this. Um, gentlemen here, I see only gentlemen raising their hands. I don't see ladies. Thank you, Chair. Um, Madam um, Minister, uh, sorry, Carl Wright, um, Secretary General Emeritus of the Commonwealth Local Government Forum. Um, you come from a country which has a highly decentralized structure of governance. Would you agree that one way for the Commonwealth to move forward is to have bottom-up development rather than top-down? I'll just illustrate that by, by the COP, which I'll be attending next week in Sharm El Sheikh. Uh, for the first time, and this hasn't been very much publicized, there will be a meeting of ministers of urban affairs at the COP, which is looking at the role of cities, at the role of sustainable urbanization in addressing climate change, because you know most carbon emissions come from urban settlements from cities, and therefore it's the, the mayors, it's the district um, chairs who have a key role to address climate change. But equally, um, most of the SDG targets, it's been estimated that of the 169 something like 100 of the 169 targets of SDGs are better implemented from the bottom up rather than top down, which essentially means local government um, by bodies like the OECD. So would you agree that for the Commonwealth to be successful, it has to be very much a bottom up exercise as well as some top down things? But I think that that is what actually we should be doing. And that is what um, member countries are doing. Um, we call in the Commonwealth to support us if um, we need support. But in terms of climate change, in terms of um, the general governance of, 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 of our countries, um, it is really up to the, 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 the member countries to carry out their programs and to ensure that the SDGs, for us in Africa, we have, um, well, localized, continentalized, if you want to so call it, the SDGs into the agenda 2063. And it reflects directly the SDGs. And at the level of the African Union, they are monitoring all the different uh, objectives that um, uh, we have set for ourselves. Because countrywide, uh, in terms of each country, they are carrying out and ensuring that the SDGs are embedded in their national plans. And I'm hoping that um, that is what is happening in other parts of the Commonwealth. I think that is what is happening because you cannot um, um, have your national development plan without um, paying attention to climate change, to women's empowerment, um, to clean water, um, resilient uh, uh, communities and so on and so forth. That cannot be the case, uh, and, but maybe um, Commonwealth should also um, see what it can do to assist countries um, in pushing uh, them towards realization. But we must not forget that all com Commonwealth countries belong to regional uh, uh, communities. And, and, and at the regional community level, and I gave the example of um, African Union, um, focus is on, is on the SDGs. And so, yes, um, some attention uh, from Commonwealth will be good, but uh, putting all of those together might be, might be the way to go. But, but we are responsible at the national level, at the regional level, uh, for ensuring that um, we attain the SDGs and uh, as part of the SDGs, ensure that um, our carbon emissions and, uh, and uh, climate is below the, the, the 1.5% uh, uh, targets that uh, we've been given by, by the Paris Agreement. I think I am going to go to the lady there. And I might take two or three questions together just to make better use of time. We have only about 10 minutes left, if Madam Minister doesn't mind. Please keep them brief. Thank you, Honourable Minister. My name is Linda Scott. I'm the Namibian High Commissioner. 
I just, um, I'm very happy to hear that you had this idea about the a framework for Commonwealth trade and investment. And I just would love to hear some more ideas um, around that, how you see that developing and growing. Thank you. And can we, thank you. Can we take another question here in the front row? Um, so, Shirji Laman, I'm an angel investor based in Britain. 90% um, of Twitter staff was uh, let go last week. Uh, Jeremy Grantham, who's a fund manager, said that we are currently going a super bubble, which is 1929 style. Um, given the youth are not engaging with the politicians of the world, is the Commonwealth really relevant when social media is taking over uh, the common narrative that is being spread across the world? Shall we take one more? Should... Yeah. Yeah. The gentleman here has had his hand up for a while. Hi, Hugo Barker from Imperial College. I work on the policy around emerging and disruptive technology. And I was really interested to hear your push for a greater um, grouping of knowledge within the Commonwealth Secretariat itself, the actual the people that work on, on this type of stuff. I think that countries don't quite realize what's coming down the line on development of technology. We can talk about AI, disruptive technology, quantum computing, and there isn't a knowledge base even in developed quite uh, wealthy countries for this stuff. And I think the Commonwealth could position it very well by actually growing that knowledge base in the Commonwealth Secretariat and sharing it across the Commonwealth as a whole. Do you think the Commonwealth would be able to unify on um, regulatory policy, on standardization of technology, on these type of topics to its benefit from that type of shared knowledge in the future? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the minister needs a chance to respond. Now, the first is on um, trade and what we can do as a commonwealth. Let me give an example. First, I make a statement that no country has developed as a result of aid, overseas development assistance. Every country that has depended on, depended on aid has not developed as it should. We have come to the realization in Ghana that we need to move beyond aid. And I believe that Commonwealth countries must move beyond aid. It is good for the richer countries to give the poorer countries um, assistance, but we should look at sustainable ways for development, and that is trade, investment. Most of our countries have natural resources. These natural resources are carted out in its raw form. We need to be able to build value addition, manufacturing concerns in each other's countries so that we can add value to create jobs for the youth. A typical example that I have seen, and it works so well, Trinidad and Tobago is not a big country. However, they set up one of their banks in Ghana. Today is one of the fastest growing banks, Republic Bank. And it has branches all over. You can just imagine Republic Bank in other African and other Commonwealth countries. It will give facilities to the small, medium, micro, small, medium enterprises. And, and so these are ways in which we can, we can, we can trade. But in, most importantly, I think that we should begin to look at how best we can leverage on our uh, competences and um, what we have in terms of resources and use that to, to establish um, and engage and establish um, manufacturing concerns in each other's country. It will be good to see uh, foreign direct investment 
uh, from big countries into the small countries. We, we really would like to see that all the time. Um, but also, what can we even do uh, as African countries? Fortunately, we have the African Continental Free Trade Area, which is assisting us, enabling us to be able to trade amongst ourselves. We are able also to look at under the ACP, the African Caribbean Pacific, um, to look at ways in which we can trade together. So all these are, 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 are things that we can do together. But for those of us that are uh, Commonwealth countries, I think it's important that we now start looking at what we can do. It would be nice to go from here to the countries that um, are, are tourism driven to see um, nationals of other countries from Commonwealth, uh, of other Commonwealth countries uh, there um, helping out. Kenya has a lot of expertise in, in tourism. Uh, it can transport it to another country and, and so on and so forth. So I think that there's a lot that we can do to, together. The time doesn't allow me to go into detail. Um, social media, whether Commonwealth is relevant, I think that Commonwealth is relevant. It's extremely relevant because if it wasn't, why would countries be lined up to join the Commonwealth? There's something unique about the Commonwealth um, that uh, we should be proud of. And I think that that in itself is something that uh, draws others to us. The other groupings don't have it. And I think we should continue to seek ways. Our, our past is the past. There's nothing we can do about it in terms of us being uh, 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 colonies of, 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 of Great Britain. But what is the potential going forward? What can we do together um, as a group? How do we leverage um, the, 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 the population of, of 2.5 with a huge uh, combined GDP to ensure that we use it for our advantage and the youthful population that no other group has? We need to be able to use them. We need to be able to put them to good use to develop our countries and also to ensure that um, we are the better for it. Um, not yes, they're, they're using AI, the new forms, ICT, and so on. I think that is uh, something that uh, goes without saying. Um, growing the knowledge base and how Commonwealth can come in. Uh, we can't get Commonwealth to do everything, um, but Commonwealth can be that catalyst to push us into. Uh, ways in which we can uh, point us in the right direction. And already they're doing so much in, 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 in various member countries, building capacity. I've talked about uh, what they do in Ghana, in other African countries, in the Caribbean, for the small island states. Madam Minister, your comment about trade and investment reminded me that the Commonwealth Business Council has always uh, advocated that there is a premium for trade and investment within the Commonwealth simply because of the fact that there is common language, common business practices. And um, I think there is a huge potential there to give it a, 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 a massive push. But there is, uh, here, the microphone here, please. Thank you. Thank you. Arjun, Arjun Sardu, the Deputy Secretary General of the Commonwealth Secretary. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for a very pertinent speech. And right at the outset, let me say, you know, we agree entirely with everything that you've said. Interestingly, the six uh, priority areas that you've identified, these are more or less exactly the six priorities in our own strategic plan. And the, these priorities have been formulated from inputs from all 54 and now 56 member countries. So they should be reflecting the needs of, the, of you know, all our membership. Having said that, getting the priority is probably the easy thing. Implementing it and having an impact on our member states, I think that is the key thing, which you, you've, ad you've addressed in your speech so eloquently. And to, to, in order to do that, I agree in-house, we must have very capable people. And I believe we, we do have a strong team. We do have a very strong networking among all the 56 member states, but also, uh, Madam Minister, we need the resources. I think that's important. 
we need we cannot address any weaknesses of any organization without looking at the resources over the last 10 15 years as well that is an exercise that we're trying to do right now the youth dimension i totally agree this is a very important aspect that we need to look at i also agree that to me if you ask me what is the weakest the weakest link in the whole commonwealth secretariat is our communication we need to enhance that and we have developed a whole plan of relooking our at our communicating strategy right from the the website and also from what we say as well we will be developing what we call a country report and every year before we send the invoice to the member states they will receive a country report and when the questions of what's in it for me does arise the country report should say explicitly what exactly has taken place in that particular country. So I totally agree, communication is extremely important. It's an area where we need to work. We're also doing a lot of artificial intelligence, but I think we can talk about this later. But thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister. Thank, thank you, Deputy Secretary General. I'm gonna squeeze in one last question there, um, the lady. Uh, thank you very much. I, I wanted to ask about the uh, expansion of the Commonwealth. We saw very recently the joining of two African nations, uh, Gabon and Togo, as well as Angola um, that has applied, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, what is interesting about these countries is that uh, they are not necessarily aligned with most other uh members of the commonwealth in terms of language or history of of empire what do you envisage uh, uh what role do you envisage these countries can play in this reimagined uh, commonwealth interesting question i think i think um the question rather should be that um what do they seek to benefit from the Commonwealth. And I think that they see something in the Commonwealth that the organizations that they belong to do not provide them. And um, so for me, I, I'm happy that uh, these countries who have um, backgrounds of um, Francophone countries have decided to join the, the Commonwealth. And I'm told that uh, they're very proud to be uh, Commonwealth members and um, already, I'm sure that uh, the Commonwealth Secretariat is, is, is looking at ways in which it can help these countries. So I think they, they've come to the Commonwealth, they've de their decision to come and join the Commonwealth is as a reason of what they can benefit from the Commonwealth, which means that the Commonwealth that we belong to is one that is beneficial if we so wish it to be. Because I'm sure that there are countries that don't solicit for any assistance, but there are countries that do. And so um, let me say that um, we belong to a good organization. Um, it's not what probably we want it to be at this point, but it's moved and improved over the period and the potential for it um, to give us a lot more than it's giving us is there. And so I think engagement and making sure that uh, we clearly uh, are focused on, 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 on the benefits and the potential and how to implement these things that we have identified is what really should be our focus. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, all good things must come to an end. Um, it remains for me to thank our chief guest, the Honorable Minister, for finding time in the midst of an incredibly hectic schedule and as I said, she's just come from New York and is back in New York tomorrow and goes to another function from here. Thank you, Minister, for sharing your insights from many years of association with, with uh, diplomacy, with foreign policy, with multilateral organizations, and of course, with the Commonwealth itself, and for sharing your vision of the Commonwealth of the future and how it can be an even greater force for good and touch people's lives in a big way. So I will request you all to please join me in a round of applause to our speaker.